Well, good morning, Walden Church. I guess I, I don't need to tell you, this has been a tough two years. I mean, primarily because of COVID and then of course what COVID did to the economy. Many people are out of work. Maybe you've even lost a job. This of course causes stress on the family and some of you have lost your marriage. And due to the illness, some of you have even lost your spouse. Maybe you've even lost your business. For a while there, in 2019, everything was going good and now it's done. My brother's church in California closed its doors for the last time. And now my brother and his wife are looking for a new place to worship. Other people are moving away going where there's work, forced to start their lives over. And I think when a crisis like this happens in our life, sometimes uh, going to church can become this quick fix for the answer in our life. You know, we say, God, if I, if I go to church, if I return to church, I promise if I go to church, can I have my house back? Can I have my health back? Can I have my wife back? Can I have my job back? We can use church as a negotiating chip with God. But you know what? It's not, it's not COVID's fault. It's not the economy and it's not whomever is president. We are not guaranteed a great life. Not even Jesus promises you a great life. I mean, you may want to think that being a Christian means everything will always be rosy and worry-free, but more often than not, Christians struggle. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but when I read this book and I read about a lot of the people uh, in this book, they, they endured hardship and they endured trial and broken marriages and issues with their parents and children who died. The Bible doesn't promise you a great life but it does promise you a great relationship. Being a Christian or being a church is about the amazing relationship we have with Jesus Christ. You know, when I first met my wife, Joanna, and I fell madly in love with her, the world around me didn't become better. You know, the sky really doesn't become bluer. The grass doesn't really become greener. It, it might have felt that way, but knowing her didn't change my circumstances. It didn't change the world around me. She just made everything else in my life meaningless because the important thing was her and my relationship with her. And then all the little things that I used to worry about, they all fell away. When you find a love that's better than life itself. This is what Paul talks about in the book of Philippians. Paul says he's found a love in Jesus that's better than life itself. And for him to live a life that matters is about nurturing that relationship. In fact, Paul's life was probably better, right? Before he became a Christian. After he became a Christian, God even says of him in Acts chapter nine, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And even though Paul writes this book, he writes Philippians while rotting away in a jail cell, he still has the capacity and the understanding to write, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In fact, Jesus taught in two of his shortest parables about this idea that, that finding your place in God's kingdom, finding your relationship with God, becoming a Christian is a lot like finding something of great value, something of great worth, so much so that everything else around you seems insignificant. Matthew 13, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all he had and bought it. See, for the treasure hunter, 
and the merchant, their circumstances did not change. The world did not improve. But now that they found the kingdom, the other things didn't matter so much anymore. You see, when you discover your relationship with Jesus Christ, those other things become less important. When you truly understand what you have with God, you realize that that, that is more valuable than everything else around you. The, the world and all of life's other issues gain a new perspective. Paul says, I have a relationship with Jesus, so automatically I have all I need. Everything else just seems trivial now. Everything else seems of less importance. In fact, he says, right, I could lose it all. I could lose it all, even my own life, and it wouldn't matter. Church may not fix your life. Christianity may not fix your life. In fact, it may actually make your life worse. I hope you're not here this morning hoping that you'll get something because Christianity is about giving. Jesus modeled a life of giving. Let's finish reading Philippians chapter 1. Verse 22 says, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul says that death is better. Right? Really, Paul? Death is better than life? That may sound morbid to you this morning, but you have to understand the heart of Paul. He is longing to be in heaven with God. And we're down here making our own little heavens on earth. And, but, but Paul says, nothing can compare with heaven. And if you ask me, I would rather be there. Paul admits that there, heaven is better in fact, Paul's only convincer to stay here on the earth has nothing to do with family, has nothing to do with home or wealth. He says, but if I stay here on the earth, then I get to work in the kingdom some more. He says, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul tells the Philippian church, I would rather be in heaven with Jesus, but I know that you guys still need me. Paul felt that he was necessary to his church. His life mattered. Paul said, I can't leave the church. It would hurt the church. It's this idea that we all belong, that we're all a part of something, that we're all working on something together. And, and Paul uh, continues he writes of the church in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving great honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. 
If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Paul says, if one suffers, all suffer. If one is honored, all are honored. If one rejoices, all rejoice. Living a life that matters says, I belong to this group. I belong to this community. And what I do here has such an impact that I am needed. And that if I were to leave, if I were gone, then my presence would be missed, just like you would miss a piece missing from your own body. Back in Philippians, Paul goes on to say, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul says, it's all worth it. Do you know, and, and remember where Paul is writing this from, right? He's writing this from jail. He is in jail. And he says, it's worth it. It's all worth it to me. I am rotting away in jail, but if I hear that in the church, that, that if one suffers, all suffer, and that if one is honored, all are honored, and if one rejoices, all rejoice, if you are standing firm in the spirit and you have one mind and you are striving side by side, then for me, he says, it's all worth it. It's all worth it if you are working together. Look at verse 28. He says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. In other words, the church working together, they are not shaken by the outside world. And he says that becomes the evidence, Paul says, that if we really live that way together, striving side by side in community, not frightened by anything, not even death, because, because death brings me closer to Jesus, a church not frightened by anything, the world would notice and the world would be convinced that it was wrong and that the church was right. That's powerful. That's how powerful and unstoppable the unified church is. Author Brendan Manning says it like this, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Paul says, not if you work together, not if you're striving side by side, not if you're one body. Paul says, my prayer is that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, of course, pastors, all, all we have is this book as a way to teach and understand the mission of the church. And we'll use this book and we'll preach these pages, but in the end, it is a different world now. The church isn't the same as it was when you and I were kids. The church isn't the same as it was when your parents were kids. And while it's true that there's no set blueprint for how to do church in the Bible, we can still look at how it all started. Acts chapter 2 starts, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I think if we dig into these sentences, if we look at this paragraph and we try to figure out, okay, this is, this is it. It's all right here in this one paragraph, right? It, to figure out the best way to do church. I mean, the first thing we see is they learn together, right? The Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, the Greek word therefore devoted implies it's an ongoing process. 
It's a continuing action. You are devoting yourself to the teaching. It doesn't stop. The church was born in the power of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and they, and they kept their shape and they kept their motivation by daily devoting themselves to a particular set of practices. And the first one mentioned is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they committed themselves to the Word of God. They were devoted to learning, listening to the Word, listening to their pastors. We, we also should be devoted to learning. Part of what we do here in this room is learning. And we gather together, we break open the Word of God to decipher what it says. Second, they shared life together. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. See, the church was a tight-knit community. They were all dedicated followers of Christ. Fellowship is not food. <laughs> Fellowship is not a meal. But it's actually an act of sharing and love and care and conversation that we give and receive when we're together. Today, I think we might even change that word. Today, I think we would, we would call fellowship community. That they were in a tight, knit community. And part of what we all missed with the pandemic was the fellowship of spending time together as a family of faith. Our life together is so important because it's one of the things that empowers and equips and grows the church. True, I mean, we are all individuals, but we share one common hope and one common goal. Christian fellowship is two-directional. Yes, we, we learn together from the Word of God, but we also need this. We need each other. We need spending time together, sharing life together. We need a vertical and a horizontal relationship. Third, we see that they communed together. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. Now, breaking of bread was one of the core practices of the early church. It was given by Jesus before the cross. He said, do this in remembrance of me. It was his last supper, but it was an act of worship that eventually became adopted by the early church. Why? Because if communion is at the center of the worship service, then Jesus is at the center of the worship service. It was his body and his blood, and they were reminded of that daily truth. Fourth, we see they prayed together. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And of course, prayer is important to the early church. The church in Acts was a praying church. The Gospels and the letters, there are full of verses that tell us to pray and to pray often. And of course, they prayed. Those first Christians, though, had real struggles right outside their door. The first Christians were, uh, many of them were Jews, so they were hated by their own race. They were also persecuted by the Romans, many of them thrown in jail, some even martyred. Some of the most deepest and most moving worship experiences that you will have is when you are in a room and you hear other members of your congregation pray for you. Prayer is powerful. We should never neglect it. Fifth, they revered God together. The next verse says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. You know, the church may have started by flaming tongues of fire appearing above their heads, but it didn't stop there. The church continued to see God move. The church continued to see God act. In fact, the word awe that's used in this passage, it carries more of a meaning that's not just respect, but it's also a little fearful. There's a little bit of afraid in that word because seeing a miracle 
being in the presence of a, of a moment that you recognize is, is God-filled to a mere human being like us, that would be terrifying. Yes, Jesus left the earth, but God never stopped working. John 14, 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. And it's happened. It has. I mean, if you look at the history of the church in in the world, you will see that the Christian church spearheaded the abolition of slavery. It was the end of the Roman Empire was because of Christianity. The whole concept of public education comes from the church. The concept of charitable hospitals and orphanages and a whole host of humanitarian activities were born out of the church. But that doesn't mean we stop. The job is not done. God is still working, and we should still be working. We need to remain in awe of God's power. We need to remain in awe of the work that he is continuing to do. Sixth, we see that they shared together. The verse says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, this is the verse that trips a lot of people up because we ask ourselves, well, how could they have done this? How could they have sold their possessions and then given the proceeds to each other? How, why? Well, because like we saw earlier, they learned together, they did life together, they communed together. So yeah, they shared. They shared their possessions, they shared their wealth with each other because they loved each other. When you love your neighbor and you see that your neighbor is hurting, then you would go out of your way to help your neighbor. That's what community means. It's more than just the name of our church. It needs to be the heart of what we do. What else? They worshiped together. It says, and day by day, attending temple together. Now, the word party would probably feel too worldly. And we wouldn't want to use that word to describe the church. However, they were a bunch of happy people. People who enjoyed being together and people who enjoyed worshiping God. And if you're uncomfortable with the word party, then think joyful. (laughs) Gatherings in the early church were joyful. And I realize that a typical church service can seem dull, especially to somebody who's not a Christian, but true worship is anything but boring. Worshiping God should never allow you to be bored. In fact, if you do find yourself bored sometimes in church, then let me suggest to you that we are doing it wrong. It's not the worship leader. It's not the band. It's not the choir. It's us. We, the church, we must be doing something wrong if we come together and find that this is boring. Things should happen when we gather together. The Spirit should move when God's people worship, not just us, but unified. Churches all over the world. Especially, look at the next verse. I think this carries that same idea even further because we see that they rejoiced together. It says, And day by day, attending temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Now, of course, yes, the passage does say in their homes, but the early church didn't have church buildings. They met in homes. And I think we lost some joy. We lost some generous hearts when we gave up meeting in homes and we ended up in buildings. In the early church, there was gladness and sharing and food and generosity and singing. It really was a party. And then what did those little home churches do? They changed the world together. The Bible says the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who are being saved. Wait, who grew the church? Who grew the church? The Lord. The Lord grew the church. 
The pastor didn't. The choir didn't. The church band didn't. The church board didn't. The finance committee didn't. The ladies' ministry didn't. The Lord grew the church. How, again? Because a group of Christians believed that the kingdom and knowing Jesus was more important, more valuable than anything else the world had to offer. And even though they were being persecuted, it didn't matter. Death didn't matter. They all found value in being a part of the body. They all found value in belonging and living and sharing and praying and learning together. And that gave them real joy. And that joy was infectious and more people wanted to be a part of it. And the Lord grew their number. Everyone served, everyone was needed, and they became an unstoppable church. And Jesus even predicted it. He did. Jesus even said that his church could not be stopped. Jesus told Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said, his church, a church working together, cannot be stopped. Is that true today? Are we prepared to say, for me to live as Christ is gain? And that we are all working members, that we are all serving members, people making a difference, living lives that matter, or would it not take that much for the church to die, for any other church to close its doors for the last time? What if we change the service times? Some of you would stop coming. What if we got rid of the choir? Some of you would stop coming. What if we got a new senior pastor? Some of you would stop coming. What if someone who was sitting in your seat? <laughs> People have left churches rather than have a difficult conversation with another church member. We don't like the new children's pastor, so it's just easier to leave the church and not come back. Really? How committed are we to the body of Christ? How committed are we to Jesus? And, you know, I know I'm needed on Sunday mornings, but you know, there's a sale at the hardware store. There's a game on. I want to get an early start on my yard work. See, the difference between an unstoppable church like the church in Acts and the church today, back then, they didn't have multi-million dollar buildings. They didn't have professionally trained, educated pastors. They didn't have instruments. They didn't have big budgets. And yet they still managed to convert the Roman Empire and they did it all without a show. They did it without vacation Bible school. They did it without a building. And their senior pastor was in jail. <laughs> right? How? How did they do it? King Solomon, in all his wisdom, wrote, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. And if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. You know that verse gets read a lot at weddings, but it really needs to be read at church membership classes. The primary role of the church is to pour into fellow church members and equip them and then send them out to do God's will. I don't understand people who say that they're believers and then they don't plug into a local church as part of their faith. You can't say, I play football if you're not on a team. You can't say, I'm in the army, if you don't enlist. You can't say, I'm a college student, but you don't take any classes. Each disciple needs a place to grow and mature alongside other Christians. And then, working together, working alongside each other, striving side by side, we partner with God in what he is already doing. And then the Lord will grow their number. Listen, God is crazy about the people of the church. 
And he's crazy about all the future believers that'll walk through those doors. So what do we do? In seeking an answer to lives that matter, what role do we play? Well, just like we saw from the church in the book of Acts, we change this. We change our mindset that church is not a place to visit. It's a community to belong to. It's more than just having your name on the membership roll. It's a place where you agree to love and share and do life together. And for just as much as we ask that you invest your money in the church, we also ask that you invest your time and your talent. You and I, we have found a love better than life itself. Let's work together. Let's show the world. Pray with me. Lord, the church is your bride and she is still beautiful. No matter the years that we've experienced recently, no matter the hardships, the trials, no matter the suffering, no matter the loss, the answer is and will always be your church. And you look at her adorned in white and beautiful. Lord, I know that it's your desire that churches work together, not just within, but also in their communities. None of this is a competition. None of this should have a competitive spirit. Each church, each body, striving together, coming alongside the work that you are already doing. Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes to the world around us. Open our eyes to the gifts that we bring. Open our eyes to the talents that you have equipped us with, that we might be sent forth into the world to be your hands and feet, to be your voice, to be an extended arm of fellowship, to give grace, to give forgiveness. May your church continue to meet together, to learn your word, to worship, to give, to sing, to revere, to commune. May your church be all the things you wish it. And when we leave this place, may we never forget we're still the church. Whether we are together or apart, we are your body. Help us to learn to strive together because we have you and you are our most precious love. Amen. Thanks for watching us this morning. Thanks for uh, spending your Sunday with us online. Of course, our church is open. Our church is open every Sunday. We have two services, 9.30 and 11. Our 11 o'clock service also has childcare and Sunday school for all ages and we would love to have you return. We miss you every week. We do. Please return to church. Continue to serve. Continue to love. Continue to be a part of this community. We need you. Churches all over the world, we need you. See you guys next week. Bye.